Ready or not? Well, we're not always ready here at Golden Black, but we're here, and we're glad Tom Deanhart joins me on Golden Black Live. It's a destination for your internet afternoon, and we appreciate uh, the fact that you are with us. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, too, who have been with us for a very long time in this show. Triple X on the hill, but on the level of Purdue tradition since 1929. Tom's been going there since 1963, <laughs> I think. Uh, it's a great spot. And Carrie and Greg Ayersman uh, have been great to the show all these years. John Basham, also been great to the show. John Basham, good folks at Basham Rental, well into their 2019-20 rentals for student housing at Purdue. Hilton Garden Inn, when tomorrow's a big day, stay at HGI tonight. And Trent Johnson, State Farm Agent Trent Johnson, all four of our sponsors, you could swing a cat there. All locations are literally about a half mile from each other, close to that State Street pro project. Trent Johnson, about as passionate a Purdue fan, but also a great community guy and has been great to us on the show as well. All right, uh, Tom, uh, we've got uh, lots to talk about today, and, and I'm, we're going to start a little basketball because top of mind awareness. Uh, obviously, the Boilermakers have a little bit of reloading to do after the, the uh, second half against Maryland. We'll take on Penn State tomorrow, uh, 4 p.m. Mackey Arena. Sold out. Mackey Arena sold out for the rest yep. of the year. Yep. Uh, just some, uh, some thoughts. Uh, what's, what's your thought process as you look at that game? Yeah, I tell you, like you said, Alan, um, the game in College Park, Maryland, Started off well, 38 to 30 halftime yeah. lead was looking good at intermission. Of course, 18 second half points for Purdue. A lot of problems yeah. in the final 20 minutes. But the good news is fans obviously know no real damage done by the loss, right? Yeah. Uh, and Michigan, they missed an opportunity, but no, I'm yeah, with you. Yeah, missed an opportunity really to put yourself in the driver's seat. But, of course, Michigan loses at Penn State that night. Yeah. And uh, Michigan State took care of business at Wisconsin, but still, long story short, your Big Ten standings as of this very moment, Michigan State, Michigan tied the top at 11-3, and yep. Purdue's at 10-3, and three. and I did a little something on the site this week where I just chronicled the remaining schedule yeah. for the top three teams, put the one loss record for each opponent, and long story short, Purdue's got the best schedule, the most advantageous schedule as far as the opponents left and their combined winning percentage. As we all know, though, plenty of roadblocks and obstacles in the Big Ten. Um, but still, even the most pessimistic fan has to like produce chances to at least get a share. And, Alan, I think a 16-4 and four Big Ten mark get you a share. may be enough to get you a share. Um, that means Purdue can probably still lose one more game. Yeah. Uh, and again, just a, a quick revisit here. The biggest pothole in my mind is the game at Minnesota. Yeah, that's a that's a big danger zone game. But again, going to Nebraska, going to Indiana, no walking not going to be a treat. So again, um, tough loss at Maryland, but still plenty of reason to be hopeful. Yeah, you know, I, I looked at that. Uh, <clears throat> I look at the schedule, and I'm not looking past Penn State because Penn State has played well on yeah. the road actually. Played Ohio State uh, very close, uh, had a chance to win that game. Uh, they are a team that uh, is dangerous. Uh, Purdue fans know that first uh, in first off based on the game on Jan 31, but I look at if, if Purdue gets through the next two and beats Indiana, then I'm, then I'm ready to say what you're saying, that they have got a great chance of getting, getting that uh, share, because I, I think you know Nebraska, that game also uh, Nebraska passed the eyeball test yeah. for 30 minutes. Now, you know, that, that program has had problems with discipline or whatever it is that causes them to wilt down the stretch. But uh, I still like – they could be dangerous, and, and the crowds are still good in, in Lincoln. This is a team that uh, could be dangerous, and they're fighting for their lives if they, haven't, if they have a life left. Uh, the Cornhuskers in the NCAA tournament, and Tim Miles hoping that they have the chance to uh, uh, somehow sneak in the tournament. Indiana kind of the same way. They're really on the outside looking in. They've got a lot of work to do, but they have good wins, and you know darn well they're going to be loaded for bear come Purdue. Time. And that's what makes it tough, Alan. The sense of desperation for Indiana, the sense of desperation for Nebraska, and even Minnesota, Yeah. all three of those teams right. – um, aren't in the NCAA tournament. Minnesota, Minnesota doesn't have Minnesota any quality maybe, wins, but they don't have any yeah. quality wins. That's part of the problem, It's going right? to be tough. So my point being that Purdue on the road, it's tough enough 
but you're also going to be facing teams who are fighting for their NCAA yeah. tournament. That's life. dangerous. Even though it may look bleak in Indiana, even though it may look bleak in Nebraska, yeah. um, they still have that faint hope. And they know a win over a 12th ranked Purdue team would look awfully good on their NCAA resume. Yeah. So it complicates Purdue's task. But I still think, Alan, hey, if Purdue really is a Big Ten championship team, Big Ten championship teams find a way to win on the road against teams that are struggling like yeah. Indiana and Nebraska. I could forgive a loss at Minnesota, um, but again, if Purdue really is a Big Ten championship team, you find a way to grit out a win in Lincoln and Bloomington the way they did in State College, uh, the way they State. did at Ohio State, yeah. and even in Wisconsin. Sure, too. absolutely. That Wisconsin win is looming her huge. And, and Wisconsin and Michigan State uh, watched some of that game after the Purdue game last on Tuesday night. Uh, the Badgers had their chances. Uh, Michigan State also is just a, it's almost as, it's almost like looking at the calendar, though. They have a little swoon, and then they figure some things out. Uh, I think that Tom Izzo's team is pretty dialed in now, back to dialed into what they want, what he wants them to do, it seems. Uh, and they now know that without Joshua Langford, this is a team. They at least know what they're dealing with. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for that. All right, as you look back at the, uh, and we'll be talking to Brian Newbert, who is coming back from what we call availability. He's talked to Matt Painter. Uh, we'll have that on the site as well. But Brian will join us at 2:40. Brian Walker also will join Tom and me at 2:20. And Brian Walker uh, needs no introduction, should need no introduction for Purdue fans, but Brian, a uh, point guard in the Purdue's last NCAA team in 1980, but actually an excellent analyst. He's just a great guy to talk basketball with. Not all that we can talk about on the air, some of our best conversations <laughs> are, but he's very, very, he got a very unique perspective. Uh, he was a great uh, point guard for a reason because yeah. he knows the game. So, But uh, looking back at Maryland, though, a lot of talk about shot selection, the fact that Purdue shoots, what is, I, I keep saying 18%, I guess it was only 16.7%. That's what Brian corrected me this morning uh, on that. But uh, hor horrendous shooting in the second half. I thought Maryland had a lot to do with that. Um, I also thought uh, maybe Purdue settled early. I don't know. I, I went back and watched it again. I got a little bit of that impression. But uh, what was your take? Yeah, some, some ill-advised shots um, too early in the shot clock. Uh, fell out of that. The ability to, to, I guess, rotate the ball and find that open shooter on the other side. Hey, maybe that extra bit of poise and patience. Yeah, yeah, that extra pass, and um, especially when you have an eight-point lead. Yeah. And you played so well, especially at the tail end of the first half, they had to surge yeah. to get that eight-point lead. Yeah, because they had momentum too, yeah. going into halftime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bernard, 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 or Bruno Fernando had really done nothing to that point yeah. either. So everything was, was swinging in Purdue's favor, and to see it fall apart like that, a lot of it, like you said, you always have to attribute and give credit to your opponent. Oh, yeah, I agree. And again, like you said, offensively, though, you can always look in the mirror and, and say you could have done things differently. So, again, tough loss. Allen, I think they were one of 16 from three-point range yeah. in the second half, too. So we, we, could, we could go on and on dissecting the ugliness of those yeah. final 20 minutes. Maybe it's good Purdue got this out of its system. We'll find the out. Eight game winning streaks over. You never want to lose, obviously. But still, sometimes this will recalibrate you and know you're vulnerable and reemphasize again what it is you need to avoid if you want to keep winning and maybe be a championship team. All right. And Tom's, uh, another one of Tom's roles and his primary role will be covering Purdue football. Uh, spring practice starting a week from Monday. February 25th, 4 p.m. at uh, the Bimal Fields. And you've been doing a great job of putting some uh, previews up there and uh, getting those. You know, you know a lot of the coaches anyway. But uh, what's your vibe now, 10 days, 10 days out uh, from that first practice? Uh, you know, what are some of the things that you know you look at now and say, boy, I'm definitely going to be watching for this? What, uh, what will that be? A lot, of, uh, a lot of question marks for Purdue. There's a lot to be excited about as well. I think, Alan, for me, the number one area I'm going to be watching is the offensive line. Yeah. Um, football fans know if you're not good up front, you really have no chance to have a great team. Yeah. And Purdue's done a great job the first two years here under Jeff Brom of putting together a solid offensive line. It's got to get better. The interior three spots, the guard and the two center positions, are really worrisome for Purdue right now. They feel confident in their yeah. tackles yeah. with Grant Hermans and Matt McCann. But again, Allen and fans, you should watch that offensive line, in particular the interior, like I said, the center 
and two guards. They've got to get that sort up. Do you think, though, in, in the transfer market, which uh, could happen also from between now and the opening day on August 31st or whenever, I think it is, it's in, in Reno, Nevada, is that like, I mean, we, are you looking at guys, I'm talking those three interior positions that may be looking, may not necessarily be the, they may be the starters coming out of, out of spring ball, but they, there's, you, you sense that maybe they're still going to be looking for replacements. I mean, Jeff Brown was always a moving, always has his feet moving in terms of personnel. Yeah, they're always, they're always looking to add personnel. If there's a grad transfer available yeah. and they think he's a good match, uh, I'm certain they would look into uh, making that addition. Right now, I know numbers are tight. Yeah. There's no scholarship availability at this point. Um, so, again, keep that in mind. But, yes, uh, Purdue's always looking to augment itself. And they've done a great job with that on the offensive line the first two years of the Jeff Brom era. Yeah. Shane Evans from Northern Illinois played two yeah. years here. Yeah. Dave Steinmetz yeah. came from Rhode Island. Did was well. Was a key right tackle. Yeah. So, again, they, uh, they, Purdue knows its issues. They know where they have to improve. They know how to go about it, and yes, the grad transfer market is yeah. always something they're always scouring and looking at. Yeah, and Jeff, like I said, Jeff Brown will not sit still. We know that. We've seen that already, and it is a uh, it is a system too of uh, if you produce, you play. If you don't, you don't, and uh, that's as simple as that. Running back also interesting, only because uh, the cupboard is a uh, seemingly <clears throat> bare. Now uh, there'll be Evan Anderson, you've got uh, Alex Horvath, you've got uh, uh, some other folks that you may be taking a look at. Uh, Richie Worship, the status of Richie, will he be out, out for spring ball? He will not be out, right? So, no, R Richie Worship will not be taking part in yeah. spring football. And, and, of course, we're talking Richie Worship had the ACL injury a year ago against uh, Wisconsin. Was yeah, it was, it, or... it was November of 2017. Uh, Hasn't played for an entire year. Yeah. Been out almost 18 Why months. Why is he so now. intriguing? Because everybody is intrigued Well, by he's him. a guy I think Purdue likes a lot. I think he's a guy Purdue believes could be their starting running back, Allen. Yeah. If he's healthy, they like Richie Worship a lot. He's a load. Yeah, big he's boy. He's a big running back. So they would love to have him back. They don't want to rush anything. That's why don't expect him in spring ball. They want to make sure he's ready to go in August. Another guy they love is Alexander Horvath, yeah. you mentioned. Um Kid from Mishawaka. Number 40. Reminds me of Mike Hallstatt. <laughs> I know he's not, uh, but still. Maybe more like Mike Augustiniak. That's we a good comparison. We're going back, John way back. Skabinski. But, yeah, those guys. But Augustiniak was up from that, that uh, part of the country. And, of course, ended up uh, as a walk-on going to play for the New York Jets. Yeah. But so, we're good. digressing here. But, <laughs> all right, so tell us about Horvath. Yeah, Hor Horvath's a guy they like a lot. I think Horvath's going to have a – He showed some things last year. He did, year. he did. So block. keep your eye on Horvath. And Tario Fuller. Yeah. They like Fuller, but Fuller's a guy who's had some injury issues. They're not always sure they can count on his availability. Yeah. So, again, Horvath's a guy that could solidify a big role for himself, uh, you know, coming up this, this season. And, and in August, of course, the two freshman running backs, uh, one from Texas and one from Tennessee, will arrive. Uh, King Daru, the kid from Texas, um, keep your eye on him. Yeah, interesting, interesting there, prospect. Yeah, you know, there's always questions with, with freshmen and pass protection. Are these guys going to be up to speed and pass protection? How quickly can they learn the playbook? They love the talent of both these young guys. And I wouldn't be shocked if one of these two guys, maybe both of them, end up playing a pretty significant role in 2019 for a yeah. backfield, yeah. like you said, that loses DJ Knox and Markel Jones. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a big factor, certainly. Quarterback, we obviously, it always begins and ends. With that, Elijah Sindelar will be out there and uh, presumably 100% or close to 100% healthy, and it certainly is his job, uh, and a lot hanging on on his high end. We've seen, pretty fans certainly have seen what uh, Sindelar can do his last three games of uh, 2017, well documented with the ACL and, and his terrific performances in, in those games, leading Purdue to a bowl and then leading Purdue to a bowl title. Um, is it as simple as saying, you know, it's it's where he goes, uh, uh, where this team goes? I mean, well, in terms of in terms sure, of he's, getting to seven or eight wins this yeah, year. Yeah, I mean, to I six. tell you what, it, it, it's better having Elijah Sindler. Yeah. I'll say oh, yeah. that. Um, and he's a great kid. We know great that. Kid, remember he was a starting quarterback in 2017 as well in that game against Louisville. Yeah. Down in Indianapolis. And so he started 18 too. Obviously, this would be his third year in a row being the season opening starting quarterback 
And I think, Alan, I did some research on a story for the site a week or so ago where I think Curtis Painter was the last yeah, to quarterback start to start three seasons in a row as the starter. So for whatever that's worth, there you go. But again, Elijah Sindelar, like you said, Alan, um, he's healthy, ready to go. Um, the big, big fun question at quarterback is not going to be Sindelar. It's going to be who's going to be the backup. Yeah. Um, Nick Sipe will be a sophomore, redshirt sophomore. <laughs> Had some mop-up duty last year in a couple games. Of course, Jack Plummer, Alan. Yeah. Red we're all freshman. we're all waiting here because <laughs> because Jeff Brom at least seemed to be smitten with him, and I think that's a fair statement. But go so ahead. So that's going to be the battle between those two, uh, and 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 the walk on Aiden O'Connell is a kid to watch as well. But again, the backup quarterback spot is going to be one that maybe has the intrigue, uh, obviously from a quarterback perspective, for Purdue this spring. Because, heck, you never know. Again, yeah, they get hurt Lars, every year. They get hurt yeah, every year, so hurt. we know so that. That's going to be interesting to watch who wins that job. And, and obviously it will be important to see what happens. We had some news. Linebacker, uh, a coach's son will be uh, joining yeah. us. Also tell us a little bit about Nick Holt's son. Yeah, Brian reported in the boiling over I mean, a week or so ago that Ben Holt, the son of Purdue defensive coordinator Nick Holt, will come to Purdue as a graduate transfer for his final season in 2019. He's a linebacker, sort of a sawed off linebacker, five foot 10, really? 220 yeah. pounds. Very productive last year in Bowling Green. Was fourth in Conference USA in tackles, led Western Kentucky. And he's gonna be a plug and play guy, obviously. Purdue needs depth at linebacker, Allen. Yeah. They've got some decent players. Marcus Bailey coming back Terrific was player, huge. Yeah. Jalen Alexander got his feet wet last year as a true freshman. Cornell Jones yeah. will be a junior, if you can believe it. He makes plays, but again, they need more depth. And here comes Ben Holt. I'm going to talk to Ben this afternoon, as a matter of fact, Good. Alan. So fans, look for that on this website coming up soon. They're thrilled to have him. Imagine if you're Nick Holt and you get to coach your son, too. Pretty cool. He's he going to yell at him, though, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's going to call him coach, not dad, too. Right? Yeah, I, I was going to say. No, I'm saying Nick's going to yell at him. Oh, yeah. yeah. We know That's that. That's a given. Uh, but I know. Anyway, I think, I think the, from what I, everything I can gather, and I'm not in practice but to, uh, very often, but the, the, those coaches love the, those players like playing for Nick Holt, and, uh, and it will be interesting to watch that dynamic. You know, Ben Holt, uh, Purdue obviously had T.J. McCallum two years ago, was a big part of that. Uh, a, a when he transferred from uh, Western Kentucky to Purdue as well, came in as a plug and play. Had injuries late in his yeah. uh, year, but he really was a big help to the 2017 Boilermakers. Dennis too. Edwards, another yeah, Western well, Kentucky sorry, guy. Right, yeah, well, you're guard obviously replacing Dennis as well. That will be a storyline that uh, that we'll be watching uh, too. Uh, you know, obviously uh, Lorenzo Neal will not be back. Uh, be back for for. Uh, spring drills, but what else? Anybody else in defense, defensively that you're really gonna gonna hone in on that you want to pay attention to, or people should be paying attention. We to? talked about linebackers a little bit. Good front line talent, a little depth. That defensive line, Allen. Um, we talked about Neal still recovering from the knee injury suffered in the old Oak and Bucket game. He'll be ready to go in August, but not now. They know what he can do anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. Plenty of bodies to tackle. Um, watch some of the younger guys like Jeff Marks, yeah. Lawrence Johnson, Branson Dean. Their chance to maybe make more of a mark inside. But, Alan, the biggest question on defense, is there a pass rusher yeah. on this roster? The pass rush was anemic last yeah. year. Purdue's been known as the den of defensive ends, right? Yeah. There's been no Ryan Kerrigan's, no Chike O'Keefe's, Roosevelt Colvin's of late. They don't need that. They just need somebody who can have, have that production. And we all know, of course, George Karloftis, the West Lafayette High School product, is on campus now lifting weights. We'll take part in spring football. You know, don't want to put too much pressure on any yeah. true freshman, but George, George was brought in here to do one thing, and that was to get after quarterback. So he'll be counted on, among others, uh, from a defensive end spot where Purdue needs more production. Yeah, Justin Lovett talked two weeks ago on the show about how just watching George's body's already changed some. I think that's the one thing that's been the most interesting about Carl Oftis has been the fact that coaches couldn't wait to get their hands on him because he's still very, very raw. Yes. He's a talented raw guy, 
Uh, and I think it'll be interesting to see what his role. His role will be there. He's going. He's going to get time uh, right from the get go, barring anything unforeseen. But you know, he's a he's a freshman and. and Great thing for him, though, that he's going to be in spring ball this, this yeah. year. That's a big deal, obviously, that, that uh, he is here and, and ready to go. So that will be a storyline, too, that we'll be watching that uh, will become, uh, uh, I think, a very important uh, fact of uh, life here is can Purdue rush the quarterback uh, and, and will, that be, will they be effective in that role? So, all right, we're going to take a couple minutes late, a couple minute break. Brian Walker has texted us and said he is on his way from his real job, which is a lawyer in Lafayette, Indiana, and uh, he is uh, making, has made his way across the river, so we'll look forward to joining, and he will join Tom and me. We'll talk some pretty ba- old-time basketball, but we're also going to talk about Brian's analysis of what he's seeing from not only point guard play, but the Purdue Boilermakers. He's in Mackey Arena every chance he can get, so we'll look forward to doing that. Take a two-minute break. Be back for the next segment on Golden Black Live. 